What's going on ladies and gentlemen, my name is Michael and welcome to Fudge Muppet. We all have favorite races to play in Skyrim and if you're like me then maybe you choose your favorite race simply based on their lore as opposed to just their gameplay features. All 10 playable races have vastly deep histories and fascinating cultures really setting them apart from one another, not just based on their looks but also their customs, attitudes, abilities and beliefs. In this video I want to explore all 10 of the playable races and actually explain how they came to be. You see, in the same way humans have changed and evolved throughout the ages, the races in Elder Scrolls have also been molded over periods of time and aren't exactly what they used to be. However, races changing in the Elder Scrolls universe happens very, very differently, mainly due to the fact that magic and the power of gods can actually have a massive influence. There's also a lot of debate regarding the truth of their past, so I'll do my best to give you multiple sides of the stories, though be prepared to thank Bethesda for some classic lore contradictions. Also, as a side note, I don't want to go all the way back to the start of creation itself in this video as that gets super complex and probably needs a video of its own. Think of this video as more of a, what did the races used to be, where did they come from and what happened? With that said, let's have a discussion exploring the races of Tamriel, who their ancestors were and how they reached their current form. Let's start off with one of the funny ones, the Orcs, also known as the Orsma. There's a few different stories about how the Orcs came to be, but almost all of them agree that they used to be elves, different to their current form. You see, while they may be considered beast folk by the inhabitants of Tamriel, their name, Orsma, has Myr in it, just like Dunmer, Altmer, and Bosma. Now, Orcs are assumed to come from the Aldmer, who were the original race of Myr on Nern, claiming to be the descendants of Adra. I strongly assume the Aldmer look closest to High Elves, but we can't know for sure. Now, that's Aldmer with a D as opposed to Altmer with a T. They vanished as a race sometime in the Morethic era, eventually turning into the other elvish races. It is said that orcs were one of the races which a group of Aldma turned into, but how did this happen? Well, they were tainted along with Trinomac, the ancient Aldmeri deity they worshipped with great reverence during the middle of the Morethic era. Trinomac and his followers were trying to halt the movement of the prophet named Veloth and his followers, the Chima, or Kaima, however you want to pronounce it. The Kaima were a group of Aldma nonconformists who decided to follow prophet Veloth and embark on a migration to the land of Morrowind. Veloth spoke to the Kaima on behalf of the three Daedra who Dark Elves follow, Boethia, Azura, and Mephala. This is relevant because Trinomac and his followers, who became the Orcs, attempted to stop Veloth's group, but it didn't really go so well. Before I tell you what happened, I want to quickly explain that Trinomac was a really important god of the early Aldma, and in many places he was even more popular than Oriel. He was a warrior spirit of the Elves who led armies against the races of men, and to be honest, this warrior theme fits in with what the orcs became. So what happened? Well, as they tried to stop Veloth and his followers, Boethia got involved and tricked Trinomac, eating him whole and apparently assuming his form, supposedly then revealing lies of Trinomac's teachings regarding Lorcan with Trinomac's own voice. Like I said, there's a lot of sources with slightly different stories, but they tend to say that Boethia consumed Trinomac and then shat him out as dung, turning him into Malakath, who we now know as the Daedric Prince, whose sphere is that of the ostracized, the spurned, and the bloody oath. His followers changed too, being cursed by the moment and changing into the orcs, outcasts. One account actually says that Trinomac's followers rubbed his remains in the form of poo all over their skin, and that's what changed them. Malakath supposedly says this whole story is far too literal. However, technically this would mean he is acknowledging that something similar did indeed happen. Metaphorically or literally once covered in the shit of a Daedra, most are disgusted by the orcs, and they were once even considered to be goblin kin. This story of the Aldma turning to orcs goes against opposing ideas which ponder if the orcs were actually an aboriginal tribe predating Aldmeri colonization or that they were created in the dawn era. The early orcs ended up with a tribal and highly independent lifestyle. They didn't all go to one area but rather to multiple places with different clusters settling in various provinces and forming small villages known for members with very close bonds. The orcs ended up having a kingdom known as Orsinium and word of it reached other orcs who then came to the Rothgarian mountains 
to live there. Unlike the other playable races, the orcs never had a full province for themselves, and I'd love to talk more about why in a future video. So we've discussed the origin of the orcs, and if you were listening closely, you would have heard me talk about the Kaima, who actually ended up becoming the Dark Elves of Morrowind. So now let's outline the Dark Elves and their original forms. Conveniently, you already know half the story. So the Aldmar, who were that ancient race of proto mer I mentioned, had actually splintered off into other groups. The Aldmer were concentrated in the Somerset Isles, and it is said that they came here from the lost continent known as Aldmeris, but some people think that's just a legend. Either way, the truth has been lost to time, but we do know that the Aldmer were originally concentrated in Somerset Isles, and one group of them had decided to follow the words of Prophet Veloth. Veloth was an elf who believed that Daedra were more worthy of worship than the Aedra. The Daedra were more powerful, and therefore to him and his followers, more deserving of reverence. So Veloth and the rest of the elves went off on a great exodus to Morrowind. Veloth and his teachings of the Daedra created a new culture among his followers, and features of this culture would eventually be known throughout the entire continent. So as you know in the story regarding the origins of the orcs, Trinomach and his followers tried to stop Veloth, and Boethia ended up eating Trinomach and turned him into Malakath. After this, Boethia helped the followers of Veloth to become the Changed Ones, the Kaima. Now the same story that said the orcs rubbed the pooed out Trinomach onto their skin also says that the followers of Veloth did the same thing, and this turned them into the Kaima. Again, this could just be looking at it way too literally, but their skin did become different to that of the Atma, looking like a darker shade of pale gold. The Kaima became elven clans who devoted themselves to the worship of Boethia, Mafala, and Azura, and also to the worship of their ancestors. As I have mentioned, the Kaima eventually became the Dark Elves. So this is where the Dark Elf worship of ancestors comes from, as well as the worship of the same three Daedra. The Kaima credited these three Daedra with teaching them their new philosophy and the principles, which formed a completely different way of life. They rejected the Aedra and wiped them from their legends. Azura supposedly taught them to be different from the Aldma, Mafala is said to have taught them the ways of evasion and assassination, and Boethia taught them everything else. Some say that Veloth himself received the teachings from Boethia in the form of dreams and visions, and then passed them on to the Kaima. Other accounts say that when Boethia came and ate Trinomach, she also spoke to the Kaima directly, teaching them many useful lessons. One of these lessons was called the Sigic Endeavor, a method that mortals could use to ascend to godhood. Trinomach's followers thought the idea of this was blasphemy. The goal is to experience Kim, or Chim, which Veloth described as a process of apotheosis which manipulates time itself. Anyways, the Kaima ventured onwards to Morrowind as outcasts, and eventually reached this land, which at the time they called Resdane. In Morrowind, it wasn't long before the Kaima found themselves with opponents, namely the Dwemer and even Orcs. The Kaima struggled massively due to their small population, though they still possessed strong warriors and fighters wielding great magical powers. The Dwemer specifically were a tough foe though due to their crazy high-tech advancements. Anyways, the Kaima were smashed in wars and in the early first era in the year 240, the Nords actually conquered Morrowind. With the power of the Thum, they were unbeatable. However, just under 200 years later, in the year 416, the Dwemer and Kaima joined forces in an attempt to defeat the Nords. They succeeded in an original Battle of Red Mountain, driving the Nords from the land. Although the more significant Battle of Red Mountain happened about 300 years later, around the 700th year of the First Era. The Kaima and Dwemer had maintained their peace until it was eventually discovered that the Dwemer were trying to use the Heart of Lorcan, an Adric artifact, to construct the Numidium. This was obviously a problem for the Kaima, and so a war broke out between the two races. Kagranak, who was a brilliant Dwemer engineer who was studying the Heart, used special tools on the artifact, and the Dwemer mysteriously vanished. There's many, many conflicting and confusing stories of what happened at Red Mountain, but here's what you need to know. Nerevar, who was the Kaima leader, made an agreement with the Tribunal, comprising of Vivek, Sothasil, and Almalexia, to keep and study the tools and the heart, but they were not to use the tools for themselves. What happened next, in a nutshell, is that the Tribunal figured out how to use the heart and tools to turn themselves into living gods. And Sothasil said that the Daedra were no longer needed. The Tribunal were the new gods for the Kaima people. This made Azura furious, and she cursed them and the entire Kaima race, turning the people into the Dunma you know today. Their skin turned dark like ash, and their eyes became red. Sothasil turned into a Dunma, but Vivek was actually part Kaima and part Dunma. Almalexia remained as the last pure Kaima alive. The Tribunal would meet their downfall in the Third Era, with Boethia, Mafala, and Azura 
being reinstated as the true gods once again. So now that you know how the orcs in Dunmer were created, we've still got eight more races to go through. To be honest, those two races took a lot of explaining, but some of the other ones are much simpler. One of these races is the Altmer, the High Elves of the Somerset Isles. As I was talking about earlier, the original race of elves who came from their island continent of Aldmeris were known as the Aldma. Please bear with me here as I talk about Aldma and Altmer because Australians pronounce their D's and T's very similarly. So the Aldma came to Somerset Isles and legend says it was sometime in the early Morethic era after their original continent faced some sort of crisis, forcing them to search through the seas for a new place to live. Tales say these Aldma refugees were lost in a storm until finally arriving in the Somerset Isles. Anyways, the Aldma believed they had descended from the Aedra and worshipped them intensely. As I explained earlier though, some of the Aldma eventually grew conflicting ideas, such as those who became the Kaima and ended up leaving for various reasons. Groups of Aldma travelled away and slowly changed into different races of elves altogether. The Aldma, however, that is the High Elves, seemed to just be a race of elves who stayed in Somerset Isles, holding true to their worship of the Aedra and seemingly changing the least. As I said, it's hard to find solid evidence that explains what the Aldma look like, but knowing that the High Elves are descended from them, yet didn't really change, suggests to me that they would look extremely similar. And that's pretty much how the High Elves came to be. They are simply the Aldma who stayed the most true to their original form, and there's no clear-cut explanation of the transition. Told you this one wasn't going to be as complicated. Now let's move on to another simple one involving the Elves, although this race can't be classed entirely as Myrrh. I am of course talking about the Bretons. Bretons are considered a human race by most, however they are actually part Elf. So how did the Bretons come to be? Well, as I've explained, many groups of Aldma left of the Somerset Isles in search of new lands. In the case of the Bretons, some Aldma went all the way to High Rock, settling here alongside the Needs. I'll get into who the Needs are in more detail soon, but for now just know that they are the proto-human race found in Tamriel in the Morethic and First Eras. So Aldma rocked up in High Rock around the start of the First Era and created a multiracial society with the Needs. The Aldma and the Needs interbred, creating a new race of Aldmeri Needs. Man These half-elf, half-man beings are what the Bretons are descended from, and also why you will still find them in the land of High Rock. At the time of their interbreeding, however, the Breton ancestors were actually the lower class of society, with the pure Aldma still ruling the province and most of Tamriel. The society was actually peaceful most of the time though, and the Manma low-class citizens helped their elven brethren. Now remember, the Bretons aren't actually the same as their Manma ancestors, and I'm actually inclined to think that they might actually have plenty of Nord in their blood too. You see, in the 246th year of the First Era, Skyrim conquests actually brought High Rock under the control of the Nords. So if these ancient Manmer were already, for sake of example, half elf and half man, then having Nords take over their society surely washed out the elvish blood even more through further interbreeding. However, in the year 369, Skyrim lost control of High Rock in the War of Succession, in which the Nords also lost their control in many other provinces. On a side note, Aelids are also known to have bred with needs in parts of High Rock while keeping them as slaves. So besides their appearance, the Bretons also reflect the interbreeding of men and elves in their innate biology as showcased in gameplay. They have a natural affinity for magic, just like the High Elves, although not as potent, but just like the human races and unlike the High Elves, they're not weak to magic. Strangely, instead of being weak to magic like the High Elves are, the Bretons are actually resistant to it. I can't exactly figure out why, but maybe potential interbreeding with Nords and Nords having a resistance to Frost has something to do with it, though I'm sure that's actually just highly environmental. Tell me why you think Bretons are resistant to magic in the comment section. Well now we know how the Bretons were made, let's go through the other human races and focus back on that group of people known as the Needs. So the Needs were a human race found in Tamriel as far back as the Merithic and First Era. Now many people don't want to take Elder Scrolls Online lore to be canon and I can understand why, but nevertheless you can see a Need in game. Game. They look mostly like modern day Imperials with a slight Nordic tinge, with greenish blue eyes and skin like a Breton. Honestly, I think that could just be to make them look cool for Elder Scrolls Online, but anyways, I'll explain their origin and then you can theorize what you think they would look like. Interestingly, where the Needs originated from is up for debate. Some people believe that the Needs are native to Tamriel and point out that there isn't a lot of strong evidence to suggest otherwise. That said, the most commonly accepted theory is that the Needs originate from Atmora, the frozen continent to the north of Tamriel, where the Atmorans also come from, Atmorans being the main ancestor race of the Nords. The Needs supposedly
supposedly came to Skyrim very long ago and ended up spreading to the other provinces. It is also said that while the Needs are looked at as just one common race, they were actually varied quite a lot, existing in different tribes in Cyrodiil, Hammerfell, Skyrim, and Morrowind during the First Era. They're a confusing race, and it's hard to know what is certain and what is not, due to the fact that they have since been wiped out through various wars and also through interbreeding. At least it's nice to know that their culture lived on in the societies of their descendants, like the Imperials. Even parts of their religions and customs were adopted by the Red Guards. But anyways, the main thing to note here is that the Needs are no longer around, but their descendants are. Interbreeding led to the creation of new races, but which ones? Well again, this is such a massive debate, so I'm open to alternate stories in the comments section, but from what it seems, here's the most likely scenario. Needs and Atmorans both come from Atmora. However, Needs are basically Atmorans who went to Tamriel much earlier. As they spread to the various provinces, they formed different tribes and became changed by their environment over many, many years. A lot of them formed tribes in Cyrodiil, forgetting their previous culture and becoming the Needs, different to their former selves. While we do not know much about these Needs because they are from a time before the main games, we do know that they ultimately adapted to the land of Cyrodiil and became different for it. These early travelers from Atmora forgot who they were, changed and became the Needs, who are actually the precursor to Imperials. So that's pretty much who the Imperials are. They are descended from Needs, who very likely came from Atmora before the famous group of Atmorans did, and forgot their ways, changing into Proto-Imperials. But how were the Nords created? Well, as you are more likely to know, other Atmorans came to Skyrim in waves, such as those who came with Isgrimor and more who returned with him when they came for revenge against the Elves for the slaughter at Sarthal. Nords are descended from these pure-blood Atmorans who came to Skyrim and interbred somewhat with the Needs. So while the Nords are extremely close to pure-blood Atmorans, they are still slightly different. Although, if Needs truly are from Atmora, and so are the Atmorans, then you could technically consider Nords 100 percent at Morin. Then again, the needs were changed by Tamriel, so are they really at Morin's at that point? It's hard to say. So there you have it, folks. That's where Nords and Imperials come from. Well, with those human races covered, let's finish it off with the Red Guards, who actually didn't originate from Atmora at all. Their ancestors originated from a whole different continent altogether, Yakuda. Yakuda has since sunk into the sea, and now only a handful of small islands remain, and very few have traveled there since. Originally, this massive landmass located to the west of Tamriel was an extremely arid place, a desert continent larger than all of Tamriel. It was very rocky too, and if modern Tamrielic inhabitants were to see it in its former glory, they would probably consider it a barren wasteland. Once Yakuda sunk, which there's conflicting theories about which you can listen to in our 5 Yakuda facts video, a wave of Yakudans migrated all the way to Hammerfell. The continent sunk in the 792nd year of the First Era, and they arrived in Hammerfell in the year 808. This wave of Yakudan warriors drove many of the Nidic people and beast folk away. Yakuda had an extremely rich culture, much of which focused on swordsmanship, and much of it has been lost to time. That said, the Yakudan pantheon has been kept by the Red Guards of today, and many of the same legends are still recounted and respected. Some Red Guards even have their main aim as the recreation of Yakudan culture in Hammerfell. Some Yakudan relics were transported over, and there exists academic institutes where one can go to study the Yakudan's history. With ancient texts translated for modern reading. Assassin beetles, which are found in Hammerfell, were apparently also found in Yakuda, but it is claimed that they were a lot smaller in the past. Some Red Guards will tell you that the beetles have grown so large because the Yakudan gods want to warn the people of Hammerfell not to abandon their worship. Anyways, in a nutshell, the Yakudans are the ancestors of the Red Guards, and much of their culture has been lost, but as far as we can tell, the race is biologically pretty much the same. So we've done all of the human races, and we've got Wood Elves, Khajiit, and and Argonians remaining. Let's do the Argonians first, as they don't take so long to explain, simply because, as always with these guys, they're shrouded in mystery and there's literally not enough info to go into their creation in huge amounts of detail. Originally, lizard men, a kind of lizard-like humanoid enemy encountered in Elder Scrolls 1, were thought to be the ancestors of Argonians. I thought this was pretty cool, however, it has since been explained that these carnivorous reptiles are actually not the distant cousins of Argonians. Nobody knows how the Argonians came to be, and no one knows when, but many Argonians will tell you that they were created by the Hist, a group of giant sentient trees, more ancient than the races of Man and Mer. The Argonian culture and society revolves around the Hist trees, and they have a spiritual connection to them. Argonian souls are different to those of Man and Elves, and most Argonians can feel the presence of the Hist trees in their mind at all times. That said, the connection
vegetation grows weaker the further they travel away from the trees, and from black marsh in general. In terms of early history, we know that Argonians lived in provinces outside of black marsh, littered around Tamriel in small tribes that were eventually driven back to their homeland when the Aldma spread through the continent. It is said that this early on in the Morethic era, many of these groups didn't even have written language yet, and in the Elder Scrolls novel, Lord of Souls, an Argonian receives a vision from a his tree, showing him that the Argonians were mindless lizards until they drank the hist sap, which then supposedly gave them thought and sentience. Whether this is an accurate representation of what happens, no one knows for sure, but the special connection between Argonians and the hist is a proven fact either way. There's lots of theories on their origins, and there are even ancient cave paintings which depict figures far more tree-like than Argonian. It's all a mystery, but in a nutshell, we know that one, many Argonians say they were created by the hist to see the world world for them where they cannot walk. 2. The Argonians refer to themselves as people of the root. 3. Argonians ingest much of the hist tree sap during religious rituals which gives them special visions. This hist sap consumption is dangerous for the other races of Tamriel. And 4. Argonians born without a connection to the hist are severely disadvantaged and struggle to understand very simple Argonian gestures. To me, this all suggests that there's a very good chance the Argonians were created by the hist. And if you want some really deep discussion on this matter, check out my video called Are Argonians Weak, where I'll explain a possible theory as to how the Hist used the Argonians for their own gain. It's a 23 minute video though, which is why I can't explain it all in this video. Anyways, that's as much as we know on the origins of the Argonian creation. Let us know in the comments below what you think the truth is. Now let's tackle the Khajiit and the Bosma. These two races are no exception to the confusion found when trying to investigate how the current races have evolved over time. Let's start with the Khajiit in which there are multiple theories. One theory which I'm not so sure is true is that the Khajiit were once simply indigenous cat-like creatures who were in Tamriel before Men and Mer arrived. Their adaptability supposedly allowed them to survive while other native creatures became extinct. This view holds that Khajiit are merely the modern forms of a beast race who survived the influx of Men and Mer who came into Tamriel. It is imperial scholars who claim this, saying that the Khajiit are descendants of a race of great cats who hail from the desert areas of Nern. They also also used various letters written by Topol the Pilot, an Aldma explorer, to back up their claim. Topol the Pilot is significant because he is credited with the discovery of the Nibbin River and the Morethic era charting of Tamriel's sea lanes. He sailed up through the Nibbin River and deep into Cyrodiil, where he apparently taught the beast folk natives how to read and write in exchange for land. Apparently around Lake Rumare, he encountered Khajiit far from their homeland. He made reference to both quad and bipedal cats, and for those of you who know all of the Khajiit breeds, then you would know that there are Khajiit who fit these descriptions. He wrote, the cat demons of four legs and two ran the river's length, always keeping the boat in their green-eyed sight, hissing and spitting and roaring with rage. The Pocket Guide to the Empire also claims that there are records from the Morethic Bosma that certain parts of Valenwood should be avoided for threat of jungle catmen. Then again, the Pocket Guide of the Empire has been shown to contain some inaccuracies here and there, so just because it's in a book doesn't mean it's true. So theory number one is that the Khajiit was simply native cats who adapted and became the Khajiit of modern times, an out alternative theory which I'm more inclined to believe is that the Khajiit had something to do with the Aldma. We know there are many Aldma groups who left the Somerset Isles and went to other provinces, changing drastically under a variety of circumstances, but what evidence do I have? Well, there's quite a bit. One piece of evidence comes from the story of Pelena Whitestrake slaughtering hordes and hordes of Khajiit. It is said that the Khajiit understandably don't like Pelena because of this. However, Pelena Whitestrake was trying to slaughter thousands of elves, not Khajiit. So why did he do it? Well, apparently he acted by mistake, and his impression was that these Khajiit were another strain of Aldmeri, and that they looked so alike. There's also the fact that there are other Khajiit breeds who each have their own look, and some of them look a lot like elves. For example, there's the Omez, who look almost the same as a wood elf. There's also a taller variant called the Omez Rat, who have skeletal features like men, but their short golden fur is of a similar color as high elf skin. So just like the Aldma settler, who became the Kaima and settled in Morrowind, and the Aldma who became the Cursed, turning to Orcs, and those who bred with Needs, creating Bretons, are the Khajiit perhaps wandering Aldma who were made into cat people? Well, it's a very realistic possibility, as strange as it sounds. If we take a look at the Khajiit pantheon, you will find that it is very similar to the old Aldmeri pantheon. This would be clue number three, but it's not solid enough because their pantheons still differ somewhat. However,
However, if we take a look at the Khajiit creation myth, we find a very interesting story. Basically, instead of gods and spirits, there were powerful ancestor cats. We don't need to go through the entire story of Khajiit creation itself. However, what's important here is this. Fatime and Anur, who are the Khajiit versions of Padme and Anu, gave birth to multiple children multiple times. Adra and Magnagi were from the first group that was born, and certain Daedra were in the second group. Anur didn't want to have any more children, but Fatime was convinced by her elder children to have just one more litter. She did, which angered Anur, and the new litter included Azura, Nerni, who is Nern, and the Moons. Anur became angry at Fatime, who fled to the void and birthed one last child, Lorkaj, which is Lorcan. By giving birth so much, Fatime felt her energy draining and she knew she was dying. Feeling this, she decided to give Nerni, that is Nern, the gift of being able to birth children of her own. Nerni asked Lorkaj to form a place for her children to live, and he did. However, he created the mortal plane and tricked many of his siblings into becoming trapped inside, living there with him. So most of the first litter was now trapped, and the second litter saw what was happening and fled. In the story, Nerni gave birth to many of her children here, the various human and elf races of Tamriel. Nerni was sad, however, because her favorite race, the forest people, did not know their proper shape and changed forms. However, what Nerni didn't know is that Fatime gave one of her other children a gift. She gave Azura three secrets, which involved a special power, the ability to take one of Nerni's children from her and make them her own, transforming them into something else entirely, so long as she made them the fastest, cleverest, and most beautiful of all creatures. Azura then came, taking some of the forest people and putting them into the forests of elsewhere, where she molded them into various new forms and taught them the special secrets entrusted to her, binding them to the moons and allowing them to change their shapes to survive. Ifri, or Jeffa, however you want to pronounce it, heard the secrets Azura was teaching them and told Nerni of it. Understandably, Nerni was pissed that her children were changed and decided to punish them by making the deserts hot and the sands biting, the forests wet and filled with poisons. Other accounts of the same story say Ifri changed the lands, but it ultimately doesn't really matter who did it. For those of you who know Wood Elf lore, this is their most important god. He is considered the god of song and forest, and the spirit of the now. Anyways, Nerni rewarded Ifri for dobbing in Azura, and so she allowed him to take the remaining forest people and give them a form of their own, and so he did, creating the Wood Elves. He did this so that they would always be myrrh and never beasts, and with this creation myth in mind, you can understand how the Khajiit and the Wood Elves have constantly warred with each other. The reason I like this theory much more than the idea that Khajiit were merely native cat people is that it talks about how they were tied to the moon cycles, and it aligns with the other likely theories that their great ancestors are probably Aldma who left the Isles, becoming changed for it, turning into the forest people, who were then later carved into the Khajiit by Azura and into the Bosma by Ifri. In my mind, both stories that the alternate theories are based on could potentially be true. Aldmer explorers could have just left the Isles even earlier, becoming the forest people and being changed into Khajiit before the other groups of Aldmer explorers came and found them later. So that was a pretty damn long explanation for the Khajiit, but it kind of covered how the Wood Elves were created too. Wood Elves are generally thought to be just another group of Aldmer who left the Somerset Isles and headed into Tamriel, settling in the forests of Valenwood. Some people claim that this group of Aldmer was sick of their life on Alanor and wanted a more peaceful and simple life in the forests, and that is what made them journey into Tamriel and to Valenwood. I'm not exactly sure this is true, but it's still a theory worth mentioning. These elves somehow turned to forest people, and Ifri then created them into the Bosma. What I find weird about this story, however, is that it doesn't explain the whole formlessness part. You see, in the Khajiit creation myth, and even believed by the Bosma themselves, the forest people were in a chaotic state, constantly shape-shifting. This is why Nern was sad in the Khajiit story. There's a chance that the Aldmar who came to Valenwood became cursed by the shape-shifting. Some even think her scene worship had something to do with it, seeing as he can give the gift of allowing men and myrrh to turn into werebeasts. There's even a text in game which states that the shape-shifting power of the Wood Elves, known as their Wild Hunt power, is a gift from her scene they should embrace, not deny. Other sources talk about what is called the Ooze. Bosmeri legend says that once there was nothing but formlessness, the land held no shape, the trees did not harden into timber and bark, and the elves themselves shifted from form to form. This formlessness was called the Ooze. Ifri was said
said to order it, creating the forest trees and plants, and giving the elves the form of the Bosma, sealing it with the green pact, saying that the wood elves must not harm the vegetation of Valenwood and must only eat meat, even if it is the dead body of an enemy. Nothing should go to waste. Any wood elf who disobeyed was said to return to such a state of formlessness. This makes sense as Ifri is credited with playing a big part in stabilizing the physical world during the Dawn era. So were the Bosma and the Khajiit, which supposedly stem from these shape-shifting forest people, always here? Or were they Aldma who lost their way? I can't know for sure, but there's strong evidence leaning towards both theories, but not enough evidence to see the full picture. Either way, both Khajiit and Bosma stories hold that the main god of the Bosmeri pantheon created the Wood Elf people out of shape-shifting forms, individuals who could not properly hold their shape. Some people also say that the early Bosma intermarried with humans, but that's another one of those things that's cool to hold in the back of your head, but I wouldn't take it as being overly significant. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, the most difficult video I have ever written for Fudge Muppet. This one was a hair puller, but it feels damn good to finally wrap my head around all these concepts, and I really hope I was able to teach you a whole bunch of new lore. Social media links are in the description. My name is Michael, and I look forward to nerding out with you again very soon.